Good morning. Good morning. Glad to hear, hear, be here with you all and, and share this time. We're going to be talking about the, the Charles and Pat that are here. We're uh, having a first communion class in between now and uh, Easter. And so this is part of that. And uh, we'll talk about baptism in connection with that. A lot of good uh, reminders and rethinking and learn new learning about what, what all of that's about. So we're looking forward to that. <clears throat> we have uh, one of our folks, Emma. There's uh, a little one for anyone at home that doesn't know. A little one who's in Houston has a follow-up testing via on Tuesday. The main testing is on Tuesday. Uh, uh, so our prayers are with her. The, the previous reports were pretty good, so we're looking for another, praying for another good report. What else do we have this morning? Other announcements? Bible study. is on Tuesday. When is Bible study? 10 o'clock. Oh, okay, you're not prejudiced. <laughs> okay. All are welcome. We have a short council meeting about after church. Where? Over uh, here. Here. Okay. Short council meeting after after the service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, oh, you're here. The president Fred, you're happy to call the short meeting. One time we had a consultant at the church, one of my previous churches, and he said, we're going to have a stand-up meeting. And that was basically what they were saying, yes, this is going to be short, we're just going to stand here for a couple minutes and that'll be that. Anyway, always good to take care of our business efficiently. Anything else? 
Paris. First thing is to sing. Let's sing number 507. Thank you. 
first reading is taken from Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. Yet shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come to you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, her wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and more more, I will give you, give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. The psalm is Psalm 22. You who fear the Lord give praise. All of you of Jacob shall give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord, all of you, all of you offspring of Israel. The Lord does not despise nor ignore the poor in their poverty. He hears the Lord's face hidden from them. But when they cry out, the Lord hears them. For you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows on the side of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall be and be satisfied, and let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. For the name of the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep on earth shall bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their sins shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, The Lord has acted. The second reading is from Romans chapter 4. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there a violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all of his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God in whom he believed, he gives life to the dead and calls them to existence of things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distress made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words that was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Amen. Jesus began to teach them, 
that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, but turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Because it is beyond human reason 
to understand how God in love reaches out in a moment that lasts for a lifetime <coughs> to cover us completely in love, forgiveness, and hope. It only happens once when you're baptized, but it lasts your entire life. That's baptism, and it's three parts. But what about the sacrament of the Lord's Supper? What's the physical part of the Lord's Supper? Bread and wine. Where in the scripture did Jesus command holy communion? Well, in Matthew 26 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Jesus said that we are to take and eat the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper in remembrance of him. And the promise of new life, that mystery and power part of the Lord's Supper, again, God in love reaches out to cover us completely in love, forgiveness, and hope. Only that doesn't just happen once in our lifetime, but each time we participate in the Lord's Supper. Forgiveness, a gift from God that we can not acquire on our own. It comes from our Heavenly Father. So the most striking mark of the sacraments is the way that they are visual signs, like water, bread, wine, to tell God the gospel, the good news of God's love for us. In fact, they are often called the visible word. But the bread, wine, and water aren't the most important things about the sacraments. The sacraments are a special gift of God because of the promise and command that they, they go with them. And the mystery part, they are special because Jesus said we should baptize and take in the Lord's Supper. <coughs> they are special because of the word the promises forgiveness and new life that accompanies them. So in the next five Sunday schools, we are going to be learning more about the Lord's Supper and how we need to prepare for it each time we take the Lord's Supper or the seeds of Lord's Supper. And on Easter Sunday, we're going to have two special young Christians celebrating their first communion. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, help us realize how special the sacraments you have, you have given us are. Commanded by your Son Jesus, physical signs of your love and grace, but also full of mystery and power. Help us live our lives every day as children of God that enjoy these awesome gifts from you. Amen.
gathering in from the parking lot and into the front door and so on, there was a, one of the boys of the church came, as he came in, saw a man standing in the hallway of his church. The man was standing quietly, looking at a display, and this display consisted of plaques and an American flag. The boy asked the man what he was looking at, and the man said, these are the names of the boys who died in the service. The boy was quiet for a while, and finally he asked, which service, 8 or 10.30? I suppose that works better where in places they have two services. It's uh, amusing to share some of the confusion or questions, you might say, of children as they're learning. But as it turns out, their questions can be right on target. Very important. Um, Art Linkletter, Bill Cosby, different ones have we have had interviews or places in videos where they speak with children and ask them questions and their answers are sometimes amusing and sometimes uh, thought provoking. The next several weeks we'll be talking about uh, communion, uh, uh, one of the first communion, one of the steps on our faith journey. Our faith journey is something like a divine game of follow the leader. As, uh, before I was here to teach, or any of us adults were here to teach, we had to be taught. And before that teacher could teach, that teacher had to be taught. And so on, down through the generations. And so I invite uh, Emma and Annabelle and everyone to ask questions. If you have a question, now is the time to ask it. Sometimes I use, use math as an example, Beverly. Yes. It builds in layers. Well, you have to have the first layers to get to the next layer. Some of us are just farther up in our layers. That's sort of like I got into college somewhere and there was a math class. I was always a whiz at math. And I got to a class where my head was spinning. I said, I don't have to have math. I don't need to take it anymore. I just liked it. I was told, and this might be a good example for us, I was told by someone that if I would just have hung in there, it all was going to fall back into place. I quit too soon. Anyway, that's what I was told. Sometimes we think, well, we've got it. And then we find out there's another layer yet. So keep asking. And it, it's good to be asked. And the good thing about having to answer a question is that I have to have it clearer in my mind in order to be prepared to answer that question. Children can be very helpful in that way asking questions, if we allow it at least. We need that help to make us think, because if we're still alive, we're still on the journey. There are still layers to be added. A uh, former member of Ada at Safe Harbor asked a great question. Why is communion such a big deal? Well, that's kind of an obvious question. I mean, the question is obvious. But again, at the same time, a perfect question for any one of us to formulate in our own heart, in our own mind, what's the big deal? What's it about? Why is it important? And there, as, as often the case in, uh, in faith matters, there's more than one way to answer the question. There's more lots of different right answers, you might say.
ways to talk about it, ways to think about it. A part of a faith journey, so Jesus' invitation in today's lesson is to follow me. Follow me on this journey. Where as you go along, new things will be revealed on this journey of life. One of the things uh, I wanted to mention was that this today's reading from Mark goes with the part that's just before what we read is where Peter, I mean, Jesus is asking, Peter answers, she, Jesus is asking, who do people say that I am? And they said, Elijah or Moses or one of the prophets. And then Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah, the promised Savior. Now, just minutes later, in our reading, Jesus says, okay, this is what it means. You're coming with me. This is what we're going to see. I'm going to be persecuted. I will suffer. I will die and be raised again. And Peter says, no way. Not a chance. Forget that. You're the Messiah. You have armies of angels. That's not in the reading, but that's what's behind that, and it's what they were looking for. And so the Messiah that Jesus was presenting to them was not the Messiah they were looking for. And if you're not looking, if you're looking so determinedly in this one direction, you may not be able to see as the Messiah arrives from another. So if we're talking about Jesus, who do people say that I am? And they said, John the Baptist, Elijah, and so on. Jesus was attracting a lot of attention, and you can bet people had questions and they had opinions. We've seen no shortage of opinions in the last year. Flying in the So if they were thinking he might be the Messiah, what they envisioned was a military leader, someone with armies of angels coming to throw out the Romans. Yay! People inside and outside the church have an abundance of, of opinions and we encounter them constantly. Many people. In, in the across world religions are willing to speak about Jesus in a positive way with great respect. As a prophet, a, a wise teacher, an enlightened spirit, a bearer of truth, a master of sacred mysteries. But these thoughts many times kind of stop about there. It's still kind of vague. What does that mean for me? It doesn't get to the part about that we have today. Follow me. Follow me. And so they, in that way, they don't do justice to his witness. They don't call for a response. Recalling, they, very few people read in that day or through really most of human history. And there weren't books to speak of. They had some scrolls, but they would be able to go to temples or some certain place to find them. So basically, where did they keep the scripture? In their head. In their head. So they undoubtedly were familiar with Jesus repeating the prophecies of Isaiah that talked about the suffering servant. Is one way that we talk about it. But their idea of strength was not one that had to be discovered through weakness, through a different approach. Dying on the cross was the furthest thing from their minds. But there it is in Isaiah, that story that we know so well is the story of Jesus. Including a God who hears the cries of the poor, a, a God who defends orphans and widows and immigrants, a God who suffers with the people, 
a God-born, vulnerable, a baby, a God who associates with the outcast. Old Testament prophecy are very clear about this picture of the Messiah. <coughs> but that wasn't the one popular, the most popular in Jesus' day. Talking about Jesus, who do people say that I am? It's one thing to talk about Jesus, to report, this is what so-and-so is saying, this is what another one is saying. It's this, the other question is completely different. Who do you say? This is like saying, I'm telling the children, please do go to the adults around you and ask them questions. And, and don't let them off the hook. Ask for the answers. Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Messiah. But Peter had a hard time then when Jesus started to tell him what that was going to mean. As followers of Jesus, this is a, a very important question. What do we say about Jesus? What do I say? What do we believe about Jesus and what do we do about it? Do we follow? Or we just want to talk about it? There was a Quaker philosopher, Elton Trueblood, who understood this, that this question was complicated. And he wrote about this. In many areas, the gospel, instead of taking away people's burdens, actually adds to our burdens. Follow me. Take up your cross. And so he told the story, uh, True Blood tells the story of another Quaker named John Woolman, a successful merchant in the 18th century who lived a very comfortable life. Until one day, God convicted him, this woman, with the, the idea, the thought that slavery is evil. And so Woolman used all of, the, all of the, 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 the resources from his business and all of his personal resources to free slaves and wouldn't stop talking about it. He was part in this country leading up to the Civil War. One of the voices that was causing a swell of opinion, a swell of thinking that said, this is not right. And a terrible war was fought. So true, but uh, uh, continuing, occasionally we talk about Christianity as something that solves problems, and, and there are ways that that's true. But also, <clears throat> along the way, it increases both the number and the intensity of our problems. As we add the layers and understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus, taking up the cross of Jesus, it calls us to places we ne weren't necessarily thinking to go. C.S. Lewis was another uh, great witness for the Christian faith in the early 1900s. And he said, give up yourself and you'll find your real self. Lose your life and it will be saved just like our lesson today. Submit to death, that which is the death of ambitions and secret wishes. Keep nothing back. Nothing in us that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. This is what we're looking to, to die with Jesus and be raised again. It has to die. And there are, of course, many examples and why is of the followers of Jesus and why we tell those stories to inform us and to encourage and inspire us. One of those, uh, one, one more for this day, of Harriet, Harriet Tubman is the, same, is the name of a woman who escaped from slavery during the Civil War. And uh, she was part of the Underground Railroad. And as she continued, the, the reward that was offered for her capture to death got larger and larger. 
In spite of that, she returned into the South more than 19 times and led hundreds of slaves to freedom. Uh, Tubman was a follower of Jesus, and again, she had that conviction that slavery is wrong and that she was called to do something. When asked about how she could be so strong, she would always say, it wasn't me, it was the Lord. I told him, I trust you. I don't know where to go or what to do, but I expect you to lead me, and he always did. Jesus asks each of us, not only well, who, do, who do people say that I am, but he asks us, who do you say that I am, and what are you going to do about it? Take up your cross and follow me. A key question for Christians. And that, to, as an answer to the young man eight years ago or so at, at Safe Harbor who asked, what's the big deal about communion? That, J.D., is the big deal. Following Jesus is the greatest adventure possible with rich rewards that begin in this life. Peace, love, love, joy, peace, patience, but not just in some future life. And there are also times when following Jesus takes us to places that are difficult and challenging, even dangerous. And communion is one gift of God that gives us courage and strength that we need to follow Jesus. A six-year-old was overheard saying the Lord's Prayer during a church service, and he said, And forgive us our trash passes, as we forgive those who pass trash against us. Again, a kind of an amusing uh, misunderstanding, but while at the same time, trespass, trash pass, this doesn't only sound alike. There's some connection and meaning. Capture some of what Jesus was saying. Following Jesus can be confusing, not only for those at the beginning of the journey, because we're asked again each day, basically, will you follow me? What does it mean today to be a follower of Jesus? Not just when I was baptized, not just when I had my was in confirmation of First Communion, or no, again, each day, along each step of the journey, a little more is revealed. Answers and questions. And it's okay because Jesus walks with us and gives us companions to share this journey. And that is Holy Communion. Who do you say I am? Jesus said. What are you going to do about it? Amen.
Company all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving. Bring vindication for victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression. Today in particular, we're thinking about Emma as she'll be tested and pray that uh, they will find that her body is uh, healthy and strong. Hear us, O oh God. You made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. Bless grandparents, parents, and foster parents, and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Console those who deal with infertility, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption, and children longing to be adopted. Equip ministries and services to families. For, for us, one of those is uh, Upbring, which is previously known as Lutheran Social Services in Texas, and particularly for their uh, foster and adoption ministry. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We await the day of Christ's coming in glory. Lead us by the example of all the saints whom you have called to take up their cross and follow you, that together we may find our lives in you. Hear us, O God. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray.
Thank <laughs> you. 